This is the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, brought to you by Cisco. Cisco is here to help set you up for success by delivering high quality foods, products, and services for your restaurant. Recording live to digital from the NC F&B studios in downtown Raleigh. Join us as we lead you into the kitchen, inside the bottle, and into the minds of the food and beverage industry. And now, could we have more time? We haven't even looked at our menus. It's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today, we have the director of Italian for Cisco of the Carolinas, Mr. Chef Bennett DePew. Welcome, Chef. Good morning, good morning. It's, it's fantastic to be here. Jeez. Usually the clapping just keeps going once I start talking. Yeah. It's hard. you got to get them to stop. I mean, it's great to be here. Beautiful morning here in Raleigh. Cool outside, just how I like. Sun's out. Can't complain. Uh, a little birdie had told me that Italian food is on the rise in Italian ingredients across America, and especially in the Carolinas. And so we really need to delve into that because we kind of glance around it and we have that idea of like, oh, what's central Italian cooking, right? Like the chicken parmesan and spaghetti and meatballs and stuff like that. But Italian cooking is so much more. There, There's so much more to it. And the kind of the, the vacillating and moving up and down the rise and fall of the popularity is something that's been very interesting over the past 15 to 20 years. Mm. So when the movement came towards gluten-free and lower carbohydrates, that started to hurt the Italian industry. So mm-hmm. we saw some people moving away from pasta, moving away from pizza, heavy bread items. These fads, they wax and they wane. The pandemic was a rough time, obviously, for, for everyone, for restaurants in general. But the Italian segment of the restaurant industry had a very unique position in there mm. where Italian food travels well. Italian food is designed, yeah. uh, American Italian food designed to work, to go. So when a lot of other restaurants were having to revamp, refigure out, remap, retool how they did their operations, Italian food was there and ready to go. Pasta travels well. It's mm-hmm. easily portable. It holds temperature. Pizza, we think of it as a delivery item. Yeah. So that, that segment tended to grow, and then it's continued to grow the last couple of years. You're seeing people start to soften up on things like gluten-free and worrying about the amount of bread, et cetera. Plus, well, I'd have to imagine that during the pandemic, as we all did, we all cooked from home, and... Italian food is like a fundamental when it comes to food. I mean, obviously, French food is like the epicenter of the culinary world, but a lot of times French food can even be kind of intimidating to technique-wise. And the beauty of Italian food is that it's all about the ingredients and, like, you get out of the way of the way of the food and not chef it up as much, I I would say, in a very general, broad sense. But, like, every parent could just do spaghetti and meatballs for the family or pizza night or something like that, and it did well. To the point that you're talking about technology or you're talking about like everybody's talking about Italian. Last year, I was at the National Restaurant Association show, the other NRA in, in Chicago, Chicago, and everything was about pizza and pizza technology and just like pasta. Like essentially, it was about Mediterranean food because there was a lot of Greek in there and North African food as well. But it was kind of like focused on there. And one person I asked just kind of randomly, I was like, what's the big deal over here? And they're like, somebody was a VP of a company and they said... Well, it's because it's the highest profit margin out here. And right now, restaurants are really struggling to figure out how to make money with a lot of rising costs. And so we are trying to, in the technology world, mitigate the highest quality product with using the highest profitable food items. And so Italian and Mediterranean food just kind of seem to soar right to the top when you think of those concepts. Would you say is that maybe Ab- a, an idea? Absolutely. So something I've seen in my career, the profitability of things like pasta. If, if you want to make money in restaurants, find a way to sell pasta or find a way to sell rice. Because those are things where it's, it's an inexpensive ingredient, but you can easily elevate it to, like you said, an excellent high quality meal. It's about mm-hmm. the purity of ingredients. You make a proper carbonara. You need four to five ingredients. That's it. If it's a high-quality pasta, that's going to shine through. The guanciale, that's going to shine through. Egg yolk and then pecorino romano, and you have carbonara. And you don't need heavy cream, as you sometimes use. Don't put peas in your carbonara, folks. Please don't put peas in it. The the Italians get angry if you do that. (laughs) Yeah. You can, but then just call it something else. Sure. Yeah. Carbonish, something like that. (laughs) Carbonesca. So, uh, yeah, there you go. From so many of the chefs that we hear and we speak to like one of their happy place like meditation for a chef is making fresh pasta i feel like 
So that doesn't seem as profitable, but what would you tell those chefs or what would you offer for them? Like, is it then in the flour you need or the special eggs? Like, what, what do you tell those guys? So the, and gals. there's a couple of things going on there in that question. The Zen. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's things mm-hmm. chefs like that are Zen. Yeah. And when I ran the, when I ran some fine dining steakhouses in Florida, I loved that I came in at 10 o'clock in the morning. The rest of my crew wasn't there till three. I got, to, I, it got to be a very, a Zen time where I had my time. So yeah. when I was baking bread, making desserts, cutting the steaks, yeah. that was Zen time. I did what I needed to do, which had to be done by a certain time. Chefs love washing dishes. Mm. Oh yeah, they'll complain about it, but you awesome. you go there and you just wash the dishes, and yeah. if dirty dishes come in, they go in the machine. The clean dishes come out. You're not under the the high temperature and stress of the line. It's a zen experience. Yeah. Pasta making also very similar. It's one mm. of those instant gratification things. Yeah, you make you mix together your flour, your water, semolina flour, your water, egg yolks. Very few, very little else ever really needs to be added to pasta. Mm-hmm. Mix that together. You can make your nice little ring of flour and carefully mix things, or you can just kind of mix it all together. But it starts with a lump of dough. You go into your extruder machine, and what comes out is already it's instant gratification. And it's beautiful and requires very little input at that point. You can just kind of, as you described it, zen right into it. Yeah. That so, reminds me of a uh, chef skinny to careless Josh over Josh, there. Josh, yeah, oh, he's always making pasta and just like, yeah, z- I, zenning. Being, I was <laughs> like, like hanging it. out in the morning with Chef Matt Kelly, just during the interview process of a job I'd never got. But but while I was there, we're, I was just like watching Chef to careless in the corner, and I'm like, is he? Does he do this every day? He's like every day. I'm like, what? And he's like, it's his thing. He gets there early in the morning, all by himself when no one's here makes the dough, rolls it out. I mean, he took one of the big, large size tables, like a, a banquet table, and just has this huge board, and he's just rolling it out. And then, like, a clothesline where he's hanging all the, the different linguinis and fettuccinis and all that, like, just doing this. And, I mean, it's, like, the coolest thing even just to watch, too, because the process for a guy that's as talented as him is so quick. You're, like, you look down, you look up, and you're, like, whoa. How did you just make like nine pounds of pasta just now? It's like, oh, yeah, it's just no big deal. He's done it thousands and thousands. Yeah, it's just muscle memory at that time. To the point I would actually argue, Matt, when you said maybe not profitable, but I think in this situation, if if you're fine with equating your salaried chef into the factor because you're already paying that guy to do whatever, then all you're looking at is some flour and some salt, some yeast, maybe not even that, but like you're not really doing anything other than maybe a couple of eggs or so, and you're good. That's the second part I was going to get into. The profitability in terms of raw ingredients, it's way less expensive to make pasta yourself. Yeah. Raw, raw ingredients, definitely less expensive. Semolina, water. It's just yolks. the time. The time. So yeah. the labor is, is yeah. a big deal. The time, and then the machine. There's an initial investment in getting a good machine. And you want, if you're a purist, the less expensive, easier to maintain machines are Teflon dyes. Teflon is, we know it as being nonstick. It's super smooth, easy for the pasta to fly right through there. But the purists use a bronze dye, and sometimes even a brass dye there. And the difference is it gives you the texture on your pasta. Have you, have you ever been to the grocery store and you look at the pasta or look at pasta, say, in your pantry? When your pasta is bright orange and smooth and shiny, we might think that looks good, but I see that, and that is There's brass all over it. Pasta. Oh. No, that's for through the Teflon dye, the okay. cheaper one. Got it. So it, it's the texture of the pasta is perfectly smooth because of the Teflon dye. Now the bronze dye gives you a texture to the pasta because the metal has little imperfections in it. It creates actually a texture on it. So when you see pasta hmm. that has a a whitish sheen to it, yeah. almost like opaque coating to it. Like that's it looks your, like the flour hasn't been rubbed yeah. off yet so much, right? That's your high-quality pasta. Yeah, Why you want yeah. that texture is your sauce sticks to the noodle. Hmm. In, in the same way that sauce slides right off Teflon, if Teflon has made your pasta noodle completely smooth, your sauce slips right off it. Teflon done. Hmm. So, I so, did not did, know that. Yeah. Dude, you're like a real specialist. Bron- I mean, <laughs> this, this, this you like really could do this for your job. <laughs> you like I'm, sell this in a store. <laughs> food, food. I wish I had the pasta here so I could show you because it's one of those things that I do show. So I'll, yeah. I'll, bring out, I'll bring out sometimes one of ours. Here's our more affordable and modestly priced one. Here's one that's a few dollars more, and this is imported from Italy, 100% Durham Semolina bronze dye extruded pasta. The, it makes a difference. In so the like the food. home cook, if you had the KitchenAid, and you got the attachment that goes on there. That's not. That's probably not the one that goes on your KitchenAid. Isn't going to be. Is not going to be a bronze dye. But I would still. I would, that's not I, even I would Teflon. Still, that's 
That's yeah, nothing, right? Plastic, it's just, probably. Yeah. But hey, w- with what you can do at home, I would never not applaud the person making fresh pasta at home, whether it's with a fancy machine with a bronze die or mm-hmm. whether it's an attachment for your KitchenAid. Anybody out there making fresh pasta at home and taking the time and dedicating to do that, my applause. Yeah. My accolades all day long. My brother. There's not a wrong way to do that. My brother's wife, the the, their family, that's their tradition. Every Sunday, they make yeah. fresh pasta. It's pretty cool. Yeah. When you have time, to be honest, like going back to COVID, when we had COVID and everyone had time, that happened in the Trujillo household fairly often. Cutting to today and in this business world of restaurants and profitability and all of that, they're going to need a guy like you with a specialist and the perspective to kind of help cut some of those corners, I guess, so that you're not spending all your time doing all these things, but still getting a good product, right? Absolutely. So as a chef, and then I think of myself as a consultant in industry. And I, I wouldn't use the term cutting quarters, but finding the most efficient way to do things, and sure. sometimes the most pragmatic way to do things while still putting out fantastic products. So while working for Cisco, of course, we, we sell products. We sell groceries. That's what we're here to do. And we have a fantastic supply and a wonderful array. But one of my favorite things is getting out there and consulting with customers, yeah. working with them, helping, hey, we're having problems operationally with X, Y, and Z. And I've been an Italian chef. I've ran seafood restaurants, steakhouses. So no matter what it is, I can go in and, and help with operations. And having been on both sides of the business is also a huge help. Having been a chef, worked for a food service, gone back to being a chef, and now back to the food service, been on both sides of the industry a couple times. So... Being a consultant for our customers, working with them. When I first started with Cisco back in 2009, our company motto was to help our customers succeed. And that's something that that sticks with me and is still in my heart. My job is not to sell groceries. My job is to help our customers do well. And whether that's in later today, after we're done here, I'm driving out to customers having problems with their pizza dough being too sticky. Hmm. And I can get into the boring details of it, levels of hydration, type of flour they're using. But that is the fun part to me. And of course, in doing that, of course, you do sell groceries, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to help a customer fight through one of their problems, get the right solution, put out a great product that's going to help them to be successful. And when they're successful, that's when we're successful too. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are out there wondering, hey, how do I, how do I get to be a Cisco specialist and what qualifies you to do that. And because a lot of people have the connotation, oh, you went to the dark side. I know when I was a sommelier (laughs) and running wine programs and then you go into sales, there's this like thing you have to get over and like, oh, I'm going to the dark side of it. But we all know it's really the bright side. Uh, Before we get there, though, I do want to pause for a specific pointed word from our sponsor, Cisco. But before we even say that, is there a specific let's say, type of pasta that you would offer a chef who is, let's say, I make my own pasta, but now like I'm getting so busy and our restaurant's busy and I'm say I'm opening up a second one. I need a good quality pasta that mimics my fresh made pasta, but I just don't have time to make it. What would you offer them? So my, my very first initial response is going to be La Molesana. La Molesana. And this is, we were talking about earlier. La Molesana mm-hmm. is a 100% durum wheat, high protein pasta imported from Italy that is, of course, the bronze dye extruded. Okay. So you're going to have that texture to it. The beauty of it is we even have it at an affordable price. So our most modestly priced pasta, this is one that I was describing earlier. This is about 2 to $3 a case more. And something that a case costs, just say the average out at like $25. So the difference between spending $25 and $27 and getting pasta that is the quality, if, if you made it yourself by hand, it's going to hold up better to pre-cooking. Most of your pasta places out there, you can't, when you're using dry pasta, how long does it take you to cook it at home? Eight, 10, 12 minutes? Yeah, yeah about that. Imagine the kitchen trying to execute small portions of individual pasta, eight, 10, 12 minutes in pasta water time. You can't, you can't. do it. So mo- almost every place out there has to pre-cook their pasta. So, right. so you want to get it cooked so it's still good and al dente. And when you warm it up again in water, it's not going to taste mushy. It's not going to taste old. It's not going to fall apart on you. So using imported high protein durum wheat pasta that's bronze dye extruded holds up way better to pre-cooking than any of the other stuff that you can buy domestic. So La Molisana. La and, Molisana. And you can get it. Anywhere that you buy from Cisco? Absolutely. That, that's one of these. So we have a portfolio that can be somewhat different across the country, but mm-hmm. that's going to be La Molisana. You're going to see in every Cisco house across the country, and you're going to hear good things about it in every Cisco house across the country. Cisco at the heart of food and service. <laughs> ah, there we go. Getting, <laughs> getting those lines out. I like it. Well, and officially, because what we are talking about is convenience, and we are talking about sometimes how technology can be that convenient <clears throat> part of the word you're trying to spread. So 
Between managing operational needs and facing logistical issues, owning a business isn't easy. And thanks to the technology and convenience of Cisco, you can focus your energy and creativity where it matters most in the kitchen. Cisco goes beyond food to deliver the technology you need to succeed from managing your business to shopping on the go to tracking your next delivery to finding the best price on Molasana pasta. Cisco offers robust modern solutions for every food service problem. Yeah, plus Cisco Shop is an easy to use digital platform that makes online ordering simple and enjoyable. Scroll through the wide assortment of products and feel confident that Quality service is only one click away. Visit Cisco.com. That's S-Y-S-C-O.com to learn more about how technology can meet your business needs, efficient and convenient. Cisco, at the heart of food and service. And also today, this coffee is freaking delicious. Who made this? This is, oh yeah. of course, from our good friends at Carbro Coffee Roasters. This is the Annabella Menesis, the Red Tipica Santa Felisa Estate, and uh, it has notes of plum, purple, grape, chocolate, brown sugar, and a silky mouthfeel. Go to CarboCoffeeRoasters.com. You can figure out where to get it or just sign up for their set it and forget it yeah. monthly package. That's the smart way to do it. That's the way to do it. Thank you, Carboro Coffee Roasters. All right, so we, the question was on the table. How do you get qualifies you in your career and how do you transition from being a chef and you were a corporate chef you'd worked and you'd run steakhouses you'd done all this and what made you go to the dark side <laughs> do you want to hear the actual story yeah like, how it happened all uh, right so sure. Um, i sure do i was working as a chef in atlanta um and it'd been a particularly rough day restaurants can just be that way sometimes they're always a little rough day it was around four or five and our cisco rep was there taking our order and then getting ready to leave. And on his, on his, as he's on his way out the door, he's like, yep, yeah, got to go home. Time to go pick up the kids and go make dinner. And I was like, man, that, what a life. <laughs> that, that sounds nice. <laughs> Let me know if you guys are ever hiring. And he stopped, turned around. He actually had a trainee with him too. So both of them turned yeah. around and said, really? Because we are hiring right now. And <laughs> look around my shoulder to see if my <laughs> yeah. boss is around. And I'm like, yeah, let me know. He's like, okay, I'll connect you with somebody. Two or three interviews later, I was on the dark side. I was over to the other side. It's I'd always been an outgoing chef and the person that, that loves getting on a microphone and talking, getting in front of people and talking to the customers. Not all chefs enjoy that. I yeah. always did. So it was easy segue for me. And I will I will never forget the first day driving home from uh, my first day with Cisco. I'd spent, at that point, 10 years of my life working as a chef. You drive home at 11, 12, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. I drove home at 5 o'clock. And traffic yeah. was annoying, but I saw families out walking their dogs. I saw mothers and fathers mm-hmm. playing with their kids in the park, people just walking the streets in the sunlight. And I know this sounds like I'm writing a poem, but I mean, it was just, it was beautiful. It was, yeah. this was a side yeah. of, of life that I hadn't really seen for 10 years. People would ask me about television shows uh, that, that were on. <laughs> but these, back in the day, before yeah. Yeah, streaming everything, these television shows were on at 6, 7 o'clock at night. I, I never watched them. I'm yeah. still not in a habit of watching television shows because all my years as chef. That's how I first jumped over to the yeah. dark side. I could add to that. Matt, he's also on the dark side because he sells wine. So sa- yeah. same job, different product type of thing in a way. But I also was a wine rep, and I always laughed because my first position – from being a wine director was to work with Southern, which is now Southern Glazers, but they're like the big liquor house, liquor, beer, wine. They are the number one, just like Cisco is the number one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it'd be like the equivalent. Well too. Yeah, of course. I think anybody listening to this show. Liquor distributor, probably in the world, yeah. certainly in the, in the United States. At the time that I was working for them, which this goes back to like 2005, six, seven, somewhere, maybe, maybe <clears> 07, <throat> I think is when I started there. They were in 38 states. Uh, They were just Southern. They weren't Southern Glazers, but they were in 38 states. And they pretty much just didn't go to the control states like North Carolina. They were like, eh, who cares? Eventually, they they came here, but their their presence isn't as as strong here. But for those that are in a non-control state, you know that Southern is everywhere. And they were always hiring. I, I laughed. It's like as soon as once I became a rep, it was like, that would be the conversation like with all of our uh, our big like sales meetings on the weekends. It's like, all right, anybody else know like, oh, yeah, that uh, wine buyer at that new restaurant that's sh- uh, open. He's a good, good dude, knows a lot. Or, oh, yeah, she just passed her Psalm 2 level test. Like, oh, we should bring in her, see if she has any interest in all that. It was like constant grooming to like get the next person in. But, I mean, my territory was Santa Monica and Malibu. 
And so literally my first day, similar to yours, and not to be a one-upper, but come on, let's be honest, <laughs> I had to go up to the top of Malibu. So it's really far. And it was like, they're like, don't worry, you don't have to go here very often. But when you go, just make sure you get a big order and take care of them for six weeks because you, you don't go there very often. I'm like, all right, fine. But I went up there on my first day and on the way home, I got to drive in horrible traffic, but look over to my right and it was the... Pacific Ocean and the sun setting. And I actually, that's where I fell in love with listening to podcasts because I just was on the road all the time and just podcast listening, looking out there, daydreaming, thinking of sales goals, thinking of all this stuff. But I had a moment like of Zen for myself, like the chefs making pasta. And it was like, oh, this is like nurturing for the soul. This is a good thing. Like not being completely bombarded by 15 employees at all times going, Hey, I need help with this. Hey, can you avoid this? Oh, so this guy's late. Oh, the dishwasher's not in. Oh, oh, oh. like all that stuff. And it felt so good to, well, to be sitting there. in traffic. It's not no like, problem. first of all, if anybody has a one upper on their first day of sales, trust me, I win, but I'll oh. get into that in, in another time. <laughs> well, just say it now. Come on. One up. My first day on the sales side, of course, anybody who listens to the show know that my first day was working for Wilson Daniels. And my first day on the job was the Anne-Claude Lefebvre tasting. That's right. In, in New York City. And so, I mean, got to taste like Grand Cru Burgundies and Chassagne <laughs> Montrachet and Merceau. And yeah. yeah, you can't top that. And my two weeks later was the DRC tasting. Of which, so, yeah, you t sent a picture of that when I was still living in LA. You were up there. Yeah, I got to take the samples home and make friends uh, with <laughs> all of the other buyers who didn't get to invited to the DRC tasting and who never get to taste DRC. And they're like, I would walk into the shop and be like, hey, do you got time for me? And I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Because I have some DRC in the bag. <gasps> Some time, yeah, yeah. For so, for those because we're being very industry with the acronyms, DRC, Domain Romani Conti, which is arguably considered the the crown jewel of Burgundy, right? Like like there's it's nothing better. It's nothing, the most expensive wine in the world. Yeah, so the like, most sought after in your car that day. I think didn't you send me a picture where you had cases mm -hmm. and you were traveling to the tasting? Or well, something? I was also transporting the wine that we had to the tasting uh, or some of it, and then bringing home the stuff that because it was, it's a very and this is getting way off topic, but it's uh, a lot of people there's have counterfeited the wine, so they steal the bottles and they are laser etched with a serial number, so you can't do that anymore. But still, people have figured out a way. So I was they said, here's the like the wine that we didn't use take it home and use it as samples. Yeah. And like Matt had a nice SUV, a German made SUV, I think at the time. And I would say that you might be transporting more, the, the wine in the car was more expensive than the actual car. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But not, not uh, a bad first day. It was a really not good a first day. day. I, mean, was, I, yeah. I had a pretty interesting stop my first day, but I, I'm still beat by you guys. Pacific Coast Highway, French wine. I'm, yeah. I can't compete. Yeah. But here's the thing. So back to that. And I want to understand more about where you came from. But the thing about this is like when we're talking about sales and we're glorifying it, it's not to say that there are it's still a job and there's still some tough moments and you get some still have some people that are difficult to deal with. But. The point is, I think you have more quality time and time for yourself. However, shouldn't that not be the case, right? Like, the, and you deal with chefs all the time. You you are a chef. You've been a chef on restaurant. But like, w I'm wondering if Cisco has any initiatives for like life balance, right? Because you you talk about that like chefs don't get to go home and they don't and they and they're they're driving home at eleven to twelve o'clock every night and maybe they have one day off a week and then they're sleeping in or whatever it is because they're so exhausted. Like we talked about this a lot before the pandemic and I know some people have leaned into it, but where do you stand on that? Where like, hey chefs, maybe schedule yourself a morning uh, and you get to go home that night and you have a good sous chef, so like you they get to run it that day and you get some work life balance. Yeah, which is something that that we're seeing we're seeing a change in the restaurant industry right now. And I think it's a good thing. It's a it's growing pains, it's hard times, but the quality of life for restaurant workers in general is getting better. We've gone from where four or five years ago, time off, six days, health insurance, a lot of things that come naturally mm. with other jobs weren't in restaurants. Yeah. Then we have the pandemic. We have labor shortages, labor difficulties. You're starting to see more and more restaurants offer these things. This doesn't as much go to helping out with the chef that's there all night, but it's a, the quality of life and working in restaurants in general is going up. Yeah. Now, as that goes up, the cost of food will have to go up as well. But I, I think that's one of those things that as a country, as, as we can absorb that and spend a little more money on our food to make a better quality of life for those people that, that work in the industry. It's not uncommon for somebody to have 
two jobs, maybe a 40 hour week job and a 20 hour week job to be able mm-hmm. to make it by in the restaurant industry. Yeah. Well, we're starting, or you drive an Uber on, we don't need on like that. We're yeah. starting to see that change where, where the people working in restaurants are able to demand higher wages and to demand better, uh, to demand better benefits that they're able to help them get a better quality of life. When yeah. You look at other countries. It's often that way where a restaurant job can be using just one job. And of course there's always going to be the fast food where it is supposed to be kind of in more of an interim job. Yeah. I well, feel like though, that's the joke though. It's like, you said it. I totally agree. Like certain jobs, like if you're working the drive-through, no offense to anyone working the drive-through at a fast food restaurant, but that job was not built and intended to provide enough revenue for like a family of four. Like it was meant to provide revenue for a single person. Like that's where that fits. And this is just me being Mr. Like, no, it's totally true. Like, but like you look at like California just passed another law saying that any corporate restaurant that has a certain amount of like a certain amount of locations basically saying like any chain restaurant has to have a minimum I think of like $22 an hour or $20 an hour but it's like guys there's a point where the threshold of the business cannot survive if you're paying people so much and you have to like you should be fishing off the pier of people that like for employment that are single that don't have crazy expenses like college tuition for their children and worrying about retirement and all that like that's this is a transitional job but to say that like every job in america is equal to the next is kind of a foolish thing to say i think like there should be some steps and levels and and positions of growth that if you're an entry-level person working the drive-thru of a fast food place that maybe at some point you work your way up and you run that store and then you run five stores and then you run a division like that's where you're making that revenue. So the only way you could do that, though, is if the first person that gets hired isn't making sixty grand a year off of like the twenty dollars an hour type of job. It's like it all kind of fluctuates. And so that's me, Grandpa, thinking about the greatest generation, pretty much all out of the workforce, and then the Boomer generation slowly being out of the workforce, but understanding that hard work is slowly kind of dying. This is slowly kind of eroding. There's a little bit of beauty in hearing from chefs that did work 70 hours a week and said, I did this because this is how this place became profitable. Like I had to do it this way. I had to do it that <laughs> but way. Now, now the flip side of that is you have nobody wanting to work in restaurants. And what Jeff is saying is, yeah, that I think that's relevant for, for quick service food, but for restaurants, which we want to go out. We want to have that experience. Mm-hmm. And if somebody can't make a full-time wage working a restaurant and support their family or help support their family, then nobody wants to work in restaurants. And we can't go to restaurants. Yeah. Anyhow. I do got... want to get back to Italian cooking. And, <laughs> yeah. But I, I do want to say one. La- economics in college. So yeah. yeah that's true. About numbers but and math and one last that. thing. You said something that triggered my mm-hmm. brain is like it's a performance-based job. So like we're sales guys. Why couldn't – why don't we just say like – not exactly the Danny Meyer, but eliminate gratuity. We raise our prices to include that. And then the servers get a percentage a of their sales. A commission. Like a commission. Yeah. I used to get anywhere between like four and seven percent of my sales of wine, like at the job that I ran or whatever. Right. And so, yeah, why not do that? You just get a percentage of sales. Yeah. And that makes you work harder and you want to be better because you're selling more. Yeah. And everybody wins. And you take out that whole tipping thing, especially with how tipping has become a lot more controversial yeah. with, with mm-hmm. counter service and quick service where you're immediately given the tablet that says, do you want to tip 10%, 15% or 25%? Yeah. Like, was this really a service thing? Mm-hmm. Well, just build that into the price. Just build that into the price of what you're selling. Yeah. Um, but then take but, that out of that whole window of why am I tipping when it's not really a service oriented experience yeah. I'm having. But see, that's, I, I'll argue like, and I, we got to get away from this, but <laughs> But anyway, I argue like I see those people working and servicing me as well. And sometimes even more intimate of a connection than somebody like dropping food off and walking away and taking your order. You're like there's you get to know your barista. You get to know your barista or something yeah. like that. Anyway. All right, so segue, segue away. So yeah. quality of life and how it can be approved. And here's yeah. where I'll kind of jump back on the, the, the Cisco and foodie thing. Yeah. Every food service company out there, we all have French fries. We all have chicken tenders. We all have these things. And again, I can argue why ours are better, and I truly believe there are. Mm-hmm. But there are other things that really do differentiate us. So things we do for our customers, like I said earlier, to, to help our customers succeed. And that includes help them have a better quality of life. So we talked a little bit back there about the technology platforms on there. 
ordering made easy through the Cisco Shop app. That saves tons of time for the customer. Number of ways in there where we're, we're keeping PARs, seeing, being able to see your past orders, makes placing your orders super easy. Customizable order guides that are sheet to shelf to make your life easy. Uh, online payment systems. You don't have to worry about checkbooks and going back and looking through all this paper stuff. Link right from the shop app. Boom. You're paying your bills on there. And that accounting is ha handled in-house? Because yeah, like in, in Winebo, it's a nightmare because we have a third party called FinTech handling it. And so like if there's anything ever wrong and they need a, 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 a credit or something like that, it's taking weeks. And then they're calling me and I'm like, I, guys, I, I can't help you with this. This is a third party thing. So Cis I'll, I'll Cisco handles it. Cisco. Yeah, that's Absolutely. huge. Beyond that, Cisco Studio. So, and this is free. This is not something you got to pay extra more for. This just comes with you being a Cisco customer. Cisco Studio. You need to be able to price out your menu. You need help with designing your menu. Certain mm -hmm. instances, we can help out with printing the menu as well. So, a number of ways that kind of take some of that burden off the customer. Costing out your menu takes a long time. And I worked for smaller companies where you had to do it just item by item, ounce by ounce, teaspoon by teaspoon in spreadsheets. And I worked as a corporate chef where we had big, sophisticated systems. Well, here's a system where it's easy for any operator to go in and see, all right, I'm selling a lot of dishes, but I'm not making money. Why aren't I making money? Oh, I don't have my menu costed out right, or I'm not using too much of the X ingredient, too much of Y ingredient, et cetera. What are the items in my menu that are making money for me? What are the ones that are not? Yeah. So it's, again, something that, that is there yeah. to differentiate us by helping out our customers. And help. let's be honest, like chefs by trade are fantastic at cooking and sourcing and leading and all of the great stuff there, but... Yelling. You left out yelling. Oh, yeah, yelling. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the walk and in, sometimes crying, too. Yeah. But, like, that's... The, putting a, a spreadsheet together and trying to figure out how many tablespoons are in a pint or a liter or something like that isn't something that you should be spending your time doing. And by doing this, and I know firsthand because like right when we came on as a Cisco client for my restaurant, my chef and I like went through. And when I said my chef and I met my chef and then I walked away. He did all of the work and put all of the recipes into the, the system and had it done instantly. And then we knew exactly where our business was. And then we actually realized, like, hey, we should probably stop selling that rabbit dish. It's super expensive and we're not making any money off of it. And maybe also we should probably really put an emphasis on selling this chicken sandwich dish because that's where we make all of our money. But it wasn't until we got that information from the Cisco app and logged in that we get it. And that's... I talk with chefs all the time, not even on the show, just like in, in after work with some beers or whatever. And believe me, the conversation is, oh, dude, if, if you're working for like if you're working with Cisco or so, you can just plug it all in. It's easy. Don't don't waste your time doing it on your own. Like, just do that. It's the easiest way to do it. I was going to ask, what's the percentage of do you have any idea what the percentage of customers that are activating that service? So I think percentage activating it, I would bet probably 60 to 70. Okay. Now that sounds very high. So what I'm – because – and what I mean there, 60 to 70 probably activate it and use it a little. Right. Now, putting your entire menu on there and actually keeping track – because the, the price is updated. As long as you're buying – and you can put in products from other folks. As long as you're buying the product from Cisco, the price is update. As, yeah. as, as the market moves every week, the price is updated. Yeah, that's the best part. So many people, the majority – 60, 70 percent do engage with it somewhat. Maybe I'm, I'm just going to do this for specials to make sure my specials, my menu right. seems fine. Yeah. But the, the number of people that go and would put their entire menu in there, that's going to be a much lower number, maybe 10, 15, 20 percent. OK. Most. All right. We've talked a lot about numbers. Yeah. What's let's get into the sexy stuff. Ah. What's the other what's the on trend for Italian right now that like, I don't know if I'm running a restaurant or I'm doing I like I need to have. So as, as always goes, since we had the Food Network and people find out more, 25 years ago, pizza was mm -hmm. all that was on trend when Italian. Pizza and pasta and Olive Garden. This pizza is, always this, seems to be on trend. Pizza yeah. always. Be. Who, yeah. When do you not want pizza? Yeah. I have to eat pizza literally almost every day. And then I'll, I have three pizza ovens at home. I'll go home and make more pizza. Okay. <laughs> but you get the Food Network and as people's knowledge grows and as people's comfort grows, people learn a lot more. Quick food fact. Can, can any of you guys tell me where in Italy pepperoni was invented? I would say pepperoni. Emilia Romagna. Emilia Romagna, and yours was pepperoni. I no, like it. it was pepperoni is from Genoa. The United States of America. The United States of America. Because there's no like 
No, pepper and no pepperoni. You'd have like a salami calabrese. That was a trick yeah. question, my it friend. It was a trick question. I, I know. I just said this I'm is like, our show. You're going to make us look like buffoons on our show? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> well, no, the point is to talk about our knowledge of Italian ingredients. Yeah. So yeah. for a long time, it was very simple Italian-American stuff. And what we're seeing the, the tendency towards is to more more real old world ingredients. If, if you go to Italy and you ask for pepperoni, they're going to hand you a large red bell pepper. Mm, and, yeah. and then be kind of confused as to why you want that. Yeah. Um, so salami calabrese is what you're looking for there, or Calabrian. Um, uh, but you're seeing more, yeah, more of a move towards ingredients maybe people aren't as familiar with. I mentioned guanciale earlier. You're seeing yeah. guanciale on more and more menus now. Yeah. You're seeing less just gorgonzola, and you're seeing gorgonzola dolce. Taleggio. Have you guys ever experienced oh, Taleggio? It's my favorite. Of yes. It's yeah. the, the Italians saw the French making brie and yeah. said, we can do this better. And they mm -hmm. did. And they did. And, and it's a did. lot stinkier, though. Yeah. If you get a young one, it's not too yeah. bad. But, but I, no, it's a, it's the good cheese the stink good if stinky. you like, like cheese, stinky, stinky cheese. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the biggest hip thing yeah. that I'm seeing on more menus is induya, uh, which you may have seen this or in, uh, you may have looked at the word and say, how do you pronounce it? It's N-D-U-J-A. Induya is, Induya. to the best of my research, the, the correct way to pronounce it and how to remember it. Just think of it. It actually comes from the same origin word as the well, word we use for andouille. Mm -hmm. So right. andouille, induya. Mm -hmm. It's spelled very different, but its etymology follows the same things. Now, what's different about induya? So most, it's a salami, but it's a spreadable salami. Mm. It's a spreadable okay. riette style salami. Mm. So your standard salami is 70, 30, 75, 25 lean to fat. Your induya? 50 50 so a lot more fat in it <laughs> okay yeah. it's kind of the it's the mother not mother the, even more salami than salami so salami is what you make you butcher the pig you have your great cuts of meat your roasts your pork chops etc the items you'd smoke you take the shoulder for your capicola which it means head and shoulder in italian if you guys didn't know that's where the capicola comes oh, right there okay Cap, yeah, i didn't know that cap Cola. and collar capicola there you go that's a real quick etymology you have there what, but then everything left the, over is what you make salami with at the anduja anduja how is it served is it in a link or is it like in a tub how does it so it's, it's in a small casing so so you make regular salami you use your best leftover trims for your salami and then what's left over after that isn't really even enough meat to make salami that's what you make your anduja with so it's about okay. 50 50 lean to fat mix in calabrian chilies and then it's packed into a casing into a skin exactly the same way you would any other salami and cured as well and allowed to ferment but it's because of that high fat content and because of the water from the Calabrian chilies, instead of hardening into a dry slicing log, it's a pate. It's a riette. Wow. So you cut open the casing and then nice. you spread it on some charred, grilled, crusty bread drizzled with a little olive oil and sprinkled with a little pecorino. And it's an absolute thing of magic. Yeah. How you dare can, you haven't eaten today? Little dabs of it on a pizza and it melts out beautifully and the yeah. fat comes out of it. And you get the spiciness from the Calabrian chilies. Even I'll scramble it with eggs at home. Right. Scrambled yeah. eggs, it melts right in there. It's it is a it's it's a beautiful Delicacy. spicy thing that you're seeing being popularized. Uh, stuffed inside arancini, on pizzas, flatbreads, pastas. Hey, this reminds me perfect segue opportunity that it's the trimmings, the not so sexy part of the pig that now becomes this delicacy because people knew how to use it, much like with the cows and brisket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll take an opportunity real quick just to let everybody know, save the date. June 8th is the fourth annual Bubbles and Brisket, which Cisco will be a part of and doing something there like yeah. last year. Beef is close to my heart, too. So I know. Yeah. We'll talk about Brasstown yeah. Beef, uh, that you were there. I was a regional sales manager. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, did, you didn't you, run You the ran place. the company. Come yeah. on. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made all the decisions. No, but Brasstown, which is something you can get within the Cisco portfolio, we knew because we set up like our own at, at the restaurant. We set up our own specific blend and we could get like our own uh, personal choice blend for our ground beef patties that we'd use for our burgers and such. And we tried a lot from a bunch of different companies and just whatever we could do. And it was significant in the quality and like flavor aspect of it. And that's, again, this sounds like a commercial, but to be honest, this is just how business works, especially when you know that there's more things that are available at your fingertips when you work with a company like Cisco. Like you could do that and get like a really awesome program set up for your beef purchasing through them. And Brasstown was kind of, that was the leader, the forefront of us. What could you say about 
with them that maybe I missed. I don't know. So so with Brasstown, yeah, I mean, they're a great local partner of ours. They're here in North Carolina, yeah. just about an hour or so west of Asheville. Beautiful little town called, well, Brasstown's actually the name of the town, but a little, the closest city is Murphy, North Carolina. If okay. you, one of those cities where if you blink your eyes as you're driving past, you will even miss that city. Right. Yeah. And if you think about blinking your eyes, you'll definitely miss Brasstown. <laughs> yeah. But a great partner of ours in the local program. And Cisco is something that we do as a company that we do very well, and we do more than any of our other competitors out there is partnering up with local programs. So yeah. we have Brasstown Beef. We also work with Chattel Farms. Uh, another one we work with out of Georgia. That's the, right there in Augusta, so kind of bordering the Carolinas, so it still counts as local for us. And they're another great partner of ours as well. Mm -hmm. We started up a new fresh seafood program, and we do a ton of fresh and local produce as well. So whether it's finding that 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 farm-raised domestic local Wagyu through Chattel, getting your special blend of ground beef work yeah. through Brasstown Beef and they always want to sell ground beef. That's the, the most of what you get off the cow, and it's the hardest one to sell off. So your own special proprietary blend of that, or whether you need to find fiddlehead ferns when it's the right time in the spring, mm. through our produce companies, we have those partners. We have, on the Charlotte site, we have a local company that makes pimento cheese. We have a local company that makes tortillas. In Asheville, we have another local bakery, Annie's Bakery, yeah. that makes fantastic bread. So that's something that that is important to us, and it's important to our customers, and the symbiotic relationships that grow out of that are wonderful as well. We have a, a dough maker, a guy that makes frozen dough balls for Italian pizza. Yeah. These guys out of Seneca, South Carolina, these are La Buona dough balls, and they're the best that you can get. They're absolutely fantastic dough balls. Yeah. Now, he makes the dough balls, sells them to us, and we, of course, then sell the frozen dough balls to our customer, and they're high quality. But he also buys everything from us. Mm. So he buys the flour. Mm. He buys the yeast from us. Super makes meta. Makes the product. Sends it back to yeah. us. We sell it to the customers. He also makes fully prepared frozen pizzas. These are for specific target markets, demographics that don't necessarily have the time to make their own pizza. So it's never going to be as good as making your own. But his are pretty darn good for grabbing a frozen one. Yeah, he and if you're not a special, if you're not a business. pizza specialist, but you still want to offer pizza for your customers, this is a solution. There you go. And that's a great thing to kind of jump onto there. People often talk about like, what's the best cheese? What's the best tomato? What's the best dough? It's what's right for you and your business and right, what yeah. you like. I mean, when it comes, I have my favorites. I have the cheeses I've had the most success with. I love pecorino. So whether it's just a pecorino romano <laughs> or a pecorino toscano, which are generally a fresher, almost more like a Monterey Jack consistency instead of hard and salty like we're used to. Yeah. But at the end of the day, whatever it is your customer needs, whatever they like best, they're, they're not wrong because yeah. that's what they like. If you tell me that vanilla is better than chocolate, but I like chocolate better than vanilla, neither of us is wrong. But bo both of us are right. So what is right for your business and what you like is the right ingredient. I, I need to clip that and play that for my sons. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the raging debate of uh, what's better, chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream, is real. So, yeah. <laughs> and the answer is yes. yes. Yeah. The answer is That's yes. what I tell them. Yeah. It's an opinion. It's not a fact. <laughs> Just as we get out of here, this is like – I look at these parallels of like when we started this episode kind of talking about like going to the evil empire, the dark side, or this is big business. But – my my thought on this, and it, it kind of like streams through with a lot of like the big, like the Anheuser Bushes and the the Southern Glazers and all, and probably the biggest company Amazon, right? So everyone listening to this, driving around, you bought your toilet paper from Amazon probably, or you bought the light bulb that you needed or something like that, and yet you still might want to say like, I want to source local. Well, the, this is a new world we live in that these distributors, such as Cisco or Amazon or whatever, all these companies, they're smart to know what the customer wants and they do source local. They do the things, the legwork and the hard work so that you don't have to, so that you can actually get the things that you want, but conveniently delivered to you. And even in a business to business sense to restaurants, it's happening for chefs. Like chefs would be like, oh man, I don't want to work with a big company because I want to sort of source local. It's like, yeah, they figured that out and they're actually supporting the local companies by finding them, by having specialists like yourself to like keep aware and say, hey, there's some people doing some really good work in the beef world or in the cheese world or whatever it might be, and then making them accessible to the end user. So it is it is a new world to live in, but it's a co more convenient world to live in and you don't have to work so hard as the customer anymore to get the great products that you want. So I do appreciate the service now that is provided and it doesn't feel as Darth Vader lo overlord looking anymore. <laughs> it's, it is really a service and let's be honest, every business is here to make money and to sustain its own self. But the way to really 
authentically be successful is to provide a great product and hopefully do something better than your competitor might do. And that's keeping yourself pushing forward as a business. So I do appreciate that uh, Cisco goes to the effort that they do to ensure that they do provide great product. So I'll get off my high horse or my step stool over here, but it is truly the way I look at big business. It's not about big and small anymore. It's about big providing help for small and still providing help for them, but everyone kind of wins in these scenarios. What I love about Cisco is how we've taken the the, the old notion of having local and then the new notion of, of, of even Amazon. I'll, I'll step it back a little further. I had a kitchen manager once who thought his job was only to have good food cost. Um, so he thought that was the only important thing. And because of that, he ran probably the least efficient and probably the worst kitchen in our group of 10 restaurants. His job as a kitchen manager was to run a, a clean, efficient, organized kitchen with great food being served to the guests. Again, I'll say in an efficient manner with happy employees in the kitchen and happy servers. Yeah. You do that, you will have good food cost. Your business will make money. Yeah. You only focus on food costs. The other things fall by the wayside. So something that Cisco's done that's great is we it's not just about selling groceries and making money. It's how can we connect with our customers? How can we help them out with the online tools? How can we take things like the demand for local and then, like you said, the Amazon model where order and get it next day, and we fuse those things together. So now if you're in certain areas of Raleigh, certain areas of Charlotte, certain areas, we have a Cisco Your Way program where you can order up till 9 o'clock at night and get local beef from Brasstown or local wow. Wagyu from Chattel or local yeah. made pimento cheese. And so it's that fusion of the convenience of Amazon, but commitment to our customers, what our customers want, our partners who we work with. And, you know, when, when, when they're successful, we're successful. Yeah, it reminds me, and I forget who said this on our show, but he was a really accomplished person in sales. And he said, and I asked him, what was the key? And he said, you figure out what the problem is and you solve it. You're talking about marijuana Irani. Was it marijuana Ronnie? Yeah, yeah. He had this great mind for just breaking things down. This is from Chaipani in, yeah. in Asheville and uh -huh. Spicewala. And that was his whole thing. He's like, I just saw a need. And he's like, all great sales come from servicing a need or yeah. a question. You find a deficiency in the market and you solve that problem. Yeah. And, and it was as simple as that. And you guys are solving a lot of problems. Like that's the bottom line. So I will say for all of you restaurateurs, you chefs out there, go to Cisco and your customers will eat and drink. Thanks for listening to the NC f and podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember five stars are encouraged.